This is video 34 in our series, Analytical Mechanics. The playlist is at the uh, website, digital-university.org. Um, in this video, we're going to rely heavily now on what we did in the previous two videos, 32 and 33, analyzing the motion of a billiard ball. Here, it's going to be sort of the opposite, though, of what we had in the previous two videos. Um, in videos 32 and 33, we analyzed the motion of a billiard ball when it was struck by the cue stick, so it was right in line with the center of mass, and it had an initial linear velocity, v naught. Here in this video, what we're imagining is a uh, billiard ball that has an angular velocity, omega naught, and then it makes contact with the surface. And what will happen is it will kind of spin around and it will slip and slide forward and then it will go at a certain time, what we call T prime, it will go into pure roll. Uh, much like the situation in the previous two videos, although in those videos what happened is it began with a linear velocity, V naught, and it had zero angular velocity, and then over time the linear velocity decreased, the angular velocity increased, and there was a time t prime when the linear velocity was equal to the radius times the angular velocity, and as we talked about in video number 30, that's the condition for pure roll. Well here, it will be just the opposite happening in this video. This starts at zero, and this increases. This starts at omega naught, and over time, this decreases. Until we have this relation, and then the ball goes into a pure roll type situation. So. That's the idea involved. Let's look at it in more detail now. So the ball has an angular velocity, omega naught, and it makes contact with the surface. So here the ball is sliding onto the surface, and it's sliding, of course, in this direction. That's going to set up a frictional force in this direction. And of course, the magnitude of the frictional force is always the coefficient of friction, mg. This will be positive direction, and this is negative. The frictional force actually points in the positive direction. We can imagine what's happening here. As the ball is spinning, then it makes contact with the surface. We have this frictional force you can think of it as sort of grabbing onto it, and it actually then pulls it in this direction. So the frictional force gives it a linear acceleration. And the magnitude of that linear acceleration, of course, is just the force divided by the mass. So we have a linear acceleration in a positive direction equal to this the coefficient of friction times the gravitational acceleration. Now, in general, of course, linear velocity equals initial velocity plus acceleration multiplied by the time. For this problem, of course, this is zero, and the acceleration is this. So at any time, the linear velocity equals mu g times t. And notice that at least for a period of time, the linear velocity increases with time. So that's one effect that the friction has. Another effect is it can set up a torque about the center of mass. Imagine here's the center of mass, and we draw a position vector down to where the frictional force is. 
And this position vector, of course, that's just the radius. So the torque about the center of mass, this point, that equals R cross F, that cross product, these are perpendicular, so the magnitude of it is just R times the frictional force, F. But now, is this a positive torque or a negative torque? So let's see. The radius vector points down, or a position vector, which is the radius vector, that points down. The frictional force is to the right. Now, when we're taking the cross product, we align the vectors like this, though, and head to head. And when we take the cross product, then the thumb points upward. So it's pointing up out of the plane, pointing upward. And also notice our fingers wrap around like this, in this direction. So the torque gives an angular acceleration counterclockwise. Well, here, clockwise is considered positive because that's sort of in the same sense as our overall direction to the right being positive. So that means then the torque is negative. So this is minus. RF. Remember also now uh, from our previous videos, and we talked about it in, a lot in video 32 and 33, that the torque, let's write this here, which is minus RF, the torque is also equal to the moment of inertia about the center of mass times the angular acceleration. So we can get a simple expression for the angular acceleration. It's just minus RF divided by the moment of inertia. Now, a general equation for the angular velocity is omega naught plus the angular acceleration multiplied by the time. Now, for our problem, omega naught is positive, but this is the angular acceleration minus RF divided by the moment of inertia. So let's substitute here. We will have minus the moment of inertia about the center of mass times time. So this is the equation for the angular velocity at any time. And notice that over time it decreases because we're subtracting this away from its initial angular velocity. So over time, the angular velocity, it starts with this value, and it starts to decrease. The linear velocity starts at zero, and then it increases over time. And eventually, there's a time, we call it t prime, when the linear velocity comes to equal the angular velocity multiplied by the radius. And that's the condition for pure rho, as we talked about in video number 30. So let's see. At time t prime, v will be mu g times t prime. So we're going to have mu g times t prime 
And this is not omega, this is just omega times r. Whatever the angular velocity happens to be at t prime. And what will it be at t prime? Will it be this when t is t prime? So the velocity, which is this at t prime, will equal omega naught minus r f divided by the moment of inertia. This is t prime. That's omega, and it's omega times r. Okay, and now the frictional force F, that's mu mg, and the moment of inertia, that is two-fifths r squared m. So let's put these values here here and here. We have mu g t prime will equal, let's multiply across here, we have r omega naught minus r squared mu m g T prime divided by two fifths r squared m. And this will cancel, these cancel. So this term right here is going to be taking the reciprocal of this, five halves, it looks like, five halves mu, and this cancels, this, these m's cancel, so this term here is five halves mu g t prime. So we have from this side mu g t prime equals r omega naught minus five halves mu g t prime. Take this over to here and this will become seven halves. Taking this over to, taking this over to this side. So we finally have this equation involving t prime or t prime equals two sevenths omega naught r divided by mu g. So this is the time at which the ball goes into pure roll. Remember it started, it had an initial angular velocity omega naught. So omega naught times the radius, and if we know the coefficient of friction, then we can determine the time t prime at which the ball goes into pure roll. Now, what are we can also ask then, what is the velocity and the linear velocity and the angular velocity at time t prime when it goes into pure roll? Now, the linear velocity, that's this, mu g t prime, only for t prime we're going to put this in. So, Let's make some room and do that. Now 
Remember what T prime is. 2 sevenths omega naught r divided by mu g. So at time T prime, V equals mu g times T prime, which is 2 sevenths omega naught r divided by mu g. That is the velocity at time t prime. The linear velocity. And it equals this. So when it goes into pure rho, the linear velocity equals 2 sevenths its initial angular velocity times the radius of the uh, billiard ball. Now, when it's in pure roll, this equals the linear velocity divided by r. So, at time t prime, when it's in pure roll, omega equals, just divide this by r, 2 sevenths omega naught. So it starts off with an initial velocity, initial angular velocity, omega naught. By the time it gets into pure roll, its velocity is two sevenths of that value. Now, you might remember from video, uh, the last video, 33, when we had the opposite situation, that is, the billiard ball began with a linear velocity, v naught. By the time it got into pure roll, the linear velocity, that equaled 5 sevenths, its initial value. Here, when we have pure angular velocity, by the time it gets into pure roll, the, that angular velocity at that time is equal to 2 sevenths, its original value. Okay, now what we've done then in this video and the past two videos is uh, having a situation where a billiard ball starts off either with linear velocity or pure angular velocity. Now what we'll do in the next video is consider a situation where the billiard ball is sitting on the surface and we strike it up here, not at the center. So now it's going to start off with a linear velocity v naught plus an angular velocity omega naught. So now we're going to have the two combined together. So let's see how we can analyze that situation, and we'll do that in the next video.